I stand before you as no expert. I am here to share only what I've learned so far as a white parent of black children and how I have been changed. I'm on a journey and I'm not even sure where I will end up. You know, when I teach woodworking, I often tell my students, we not only learn from our own mistakes, but we can also learn from the mistakes of others. I hope you can learn some things from my sharing my mistakes and learnings with you. So just as background, I should tell you a few things. I was born in Indiana, grew up mostly in Pennsylvania, first around Scranton and then Lancaster County. It was the 60s and 70s. I was tuned in to racial justice, but I'm not sure exactly from where that influence was coming. I think mostly my mother and her family who held highly the value of fairness for all. Her parents, my grandparents, influenced me a lot growing up. In any case, I remember it being important to me. I also remember at age 12 or so talking about having children. I wanted to adopt, I, and I wanted to adopt children of all different races. My relatives were surprised by my announcement, probably on a few different levels, but did not try to dissuade me. Now you must all understand also, the areas I grew up in were almost entirely white. I had very little contact with different racial groups. So the social norms and ways of looking at the world were very myopic. In my very suburban high school, there was only one black person. At that time, I started to equate socioeconomics and race as being not only tied together, but in my mind, explained, um, explained why there was so much inequity. Black and brown folks specifically were poor and therefore had less opportunity. I did understand class privilege, if not race privilege. My wife and I had been together for over five years when we started seriously considering having children. It took us a few more years to figure out how to start our family. Well, as things would have it, we started to seriously consider adoption in 2005. When we asked our adopt, when, when we started, when we started our adoption process, one of the questions we, at, we were asked was, are you willing to adopt a child of a different race? Our answer was yes, of course. The next question threw me. Do you have a network to support that child's culture? Huh, didn't think about that. So we saw the only culture we could support given our friend circle was African American. Wow, I was learning. Very quickly, we were identified as a potential foster home for our soon-to-be daughter. She had just come into the system and was hard of hearing and needed a home that could communicate with her. For those of you who don't know, my wife is fluent in sign language as a teacher in a deaf school. A year later, we adopted her as we, the adults, negotiated creating a family of a seven-year-old black hard of hearing child and two white moms. I can't even imagine what she was trying to negotiate. Because there are so many issues around communication, school discipline, and whatnot, understanding my daughter as a black girl in a white home took a back seat for quite a while. Overall, my wife and I were content with our, the family as it stood. We felt like the serendipity that placed our daughter in our home was a clear sign it was meant to be. We discussed not actively looking for a sibling for her. However, should something come up, we would go for it. In 2007, we got a call from the agency out of the blue. They had a two and a half year old boy who may need adoption. Would we be interested? Well, there it was again, this child falling into our laps. So of course we said yes. This is where race started to really become an apparent issue for us. A two and a half year old African American boy was way different than a then nine year old girl in terms of how we were perceived as parents, it seemed. 
When he first came home, I was often carrying our son, mostly because it felt as though he really needed it. But also, I wanted to build that bond, and it was important to me as well. I ran into quite a bit of cultural pushback from some of my older black neighbors and even some African-American strangers. It was clear carrying a child that old was seen as spoiling him among older African-Americans. That was my first inkling that the way I raised my children could very well be so culturally different than many of my neighbors. Huh. But on the other hand, it wasn't so with my friends. So I was heartened to know that there was a range. Even now, I keep my eyes and ears open and pay attention for mismatches so I can make adjustments if need be. A year later, I realized when he was in a predominantly white preschool, his impulsivity was seen as a problem and potentially dangerous for other children. But when we moved him to an all-black setting, he was just one of the boys. Huh. This helped me recognize some of my own issues as a teacher. Years before, when a neighbor child called Germantown Friends School, the school where I work, a white school, I got defensive. I don't do that anymore. My school tries to be multicultural and is doing better than many. But I see it differently now that I have built black children. I started to realize all the ways I have reinforced stereotype and or nailed the wrong kid for behaviors. You see, often we white teachers in a predominantly white setting catch kids of color in disruptive behavior much more quickly than we do the white kids doing similar things. White kids often know how to stay under the radar, whereas it's so much harder for the kids of color to do that. But, that's, but what's worse is there's almost an expectation that the disturbance is the kid or kids of color. To disrupt the way schools often work in this way, one of my colleagues, a PE teacher, started to consciously never call out kids of color, especially black kids, if there was some commotion. She would call out the nearest white kid instead. Her actions surprised the white kids who almost banked on the black kids getting called out as they almost always were. Her example helped me change the way I ran, run my classroom. Another way I started to pay attention to my teaching practices was in my report writing. I realized I had been guilty of shading descriptions of behavior one way for a white kid and a different way for a black kid, even though the behavior, when I really thought about it, was the same. And I realized before I had my kids that I could easily justify my comments. Wow, I don't do that anymore either. Just recently, I saw a fifth grade biracial boy trying to trip his white classmate in the lunchroom. I went up to speak to him and let him know he was being too rambunctious for the venue. His shoulders dropped and he let, let out a big sigh and he started to walk away with his head down. I stopped him. What's wrong, I asked. He almost wouldn't tell me, but I pressed him. He said that a friend had tripped, that friend had tripped him on the stairs just before they got to the cafeteria. Ah, I said, I'll take care of it. Had I not listened, he would have chalked it up to, here we go again. That's what his body language was telling me. I know these are the stories I will need to listen to and show understanding of when my son experiences the same things. The privilege I have just because I was born and raised white in this country is so deeply ingrained in me, it is so much a part of the way I see the world, and it is so deep it's hard to consciously see a different point of view. I have been oblivious to my white privilege and I continue to be in some areas. I have learned so much from raising my children, but more importantly, from educating myself as much as possible. The study I do around race is incredibly challenging and deep. The level of critical thinking I have done to unlearn and deepen my understandings continues to be very rewarding. It seems as though, as my consciousness is being raised, to borrow a term from the feminist movement, so is the nation's. 
we are challenged more and more to confront our staid understandings of what is normal and right and try to see from other perspectives. It's funny how these initial understandings, those initial understandings, still haunt me. I am challenged to rethink what I've been taught, either by subtle messages around me or deliberately. Just a few years ago, I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was a UU conference, and we were learning a local, the local history. We went to the historically black neighborhood to see the area and experience a monument built to memorialize the huge race riots that happened there in 1921. The Greenwood District was known as Black Wall Street and the most affluent black community in the United States at the time. It was burnt to the ground in those riots. The fact that in 1921 there was a black neighborhood that was affluent boggled my mind. There it was, that white superiority raising its head again. I was so sure that, especially in the 20s and before that, there was no way for people of color to make a good living. Boy, and wow, what a wake-up call for me to realize the stuff I'd been taught, again, directly or indirectly, was so bogus. Those old ideas of socioeconomics as being the main oppression of people of color were still in there. I learned to challenge myself deeper from Peggy McIntosh. I was well into my study about racial justice when I saw Peggy McIntosh for the first time. I had read her work, White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack, and was not expecting anything to be revelatory in her presentation, partly because it was written in the 1980s. I was wrong. She taught me two things that day. She started to explain how she came to do racial justice work after having been a strong feminist in an academic world. She described working with men in an academic setting to get women's studies courses into the core curriculum of many universities. She worked for months with these very nice men who seemed to understand the issues as she laid them out. But when the proposal came at the end of their work together, the men backpedaled and said, no way. There was no place for women's studies courses in the core curriculum and proceeded to cite all sorts of reasons. This happened three years running. Her realization of how someone could be very nice and cooperative and yet so oppressive opened my eyes as well. I'd seen myself as a good white person with all the best intentions, so how could I participate in oppressive, oppressive action, practices? Another learning. The second thing Peggy taught me that day is why I was having a hard time seeing how I could be oppressive. She described her method in writing that pivotal piece, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. She wanted to know how she benefited from her skin color. She thought and she thought about it. And she was having a hard time coming up with even a few ways white privilege had benefited her. It wasn't until she would meditate on, on it just before bed. Then in the middle of the night, she would wake up with the realization and write it down. Her initial list around, was around 40 items that she got only from going deep into her subconscious. Aha. Now I understood another thing. This stuff is so deep, it is hard to see consciously. It isn't my fault I can't see it, but I need to keep educating myself to the issues. I need to literally raise my consciousness to see from another point of view. Another time I was in a workshop. It was a very open and honest setting, and sometimes raw. More than one of the participants wondered how a woman can effectively, a white woman, can effectively raise a black son. I must tell you, I was taken aback. I had to really think about this. And I would answer the same way to this day, even though I have a different understanding now. I said with love and consistency. However, as my child grows up, I have more and more understanding of the question. His is a tricky place at times. I already had some of my friends tell me how they had to tell their sons how to respond when the police pulled them over. 
Not if, but when. Eyes straight ahead, hands on the wheel, yes sir, no sir. I know this is the speech I may make when my son becomes 16 or even before. But the other things he faces are not as easy or concrete. Last year when we were on vacation in Rehoboth Beach, my wife was growing more and more uneasy with our son's penchant for playing with toy guns and even using his finger to shoot things as we were walking around town. I, on the other hand, was given an air gun at age five and grew up with cap pistols as part of my childhood. Again, I grew up in the suburbs and she grew up in the city. So in an effort to help him understand our dilemma, we chose to spell it out to him. As we were waiting for a meal in a restaurant, we told him, as a black boy, your innocent play of shooting could be seen by some white folks as violent and dangerous behavior. It isn't fair, but you need to be aware. When you are walking around in public, we want you to stop shooting things. Our son grew quiet, but seemed okay. Soon after we ate our meal, as we wandered the boardwalk, he started to complain about feeling ill. The next thing, he was having stomach cramps. He was stressed out. How do I help him negotiate the world when I haven't had to live it in the way he does? There are so many ways to negotiate, so many things to negotiate when raising children. Even though I live in Germantown, 65% black population, my kids are constantly surrounded by mostly white people. At family functions, parties, community pools in the burbs, we need to be vigilant in helping our kids develop positive racial identities when we also develop positive racial identical identities. It's a different process for my black children than it is for their white moms. For them, I need to make sure they have black, positive black role models. That's where we rely on church, friends, and neighbors. We try to hold up black leaders as examples to our children, as well as holding up instances of anti-racist resistance. We have been talking about race from early on by pointing out racial differences in picture books. We made sure there were black dolls and figures to play with and books with black characters in them and artwork representing people who look like them on the walls. Our daughter is now in high school and the African American history courses and current events being discussed at school help bring up issues for our 10 year old at the dinner table that allow us to explain in ways he can process for now. For me, it's educating myself in the history of racism to recognize and debunk ingrained erroneous messages around race and owning my whiteness while remembering there are lots of white folks who have worked and are working hard as anti-racists and align myself with them and to forgive myself and others as we sometimes bumble along in this journey together. So, as a white parent of African American children, what have I learned most? Just as other parents, our path is unclear, but with love and care and striving to listen and empower, we will do well by our children. <laughs>